I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Stephen Kreisick of the Lotto Jumbo team as well, and Adam Yates of Orica Green Edge, and Anthony Turgis, who had a little bit of a tumble as he headed in towards Scarborough, but stayed on his bike. Great Britain have won their first medal. It was Adam Peaty in a world record time, breaking his own world record. She punches the air, and she crosses that blue finish line. The world champion of 12 months ago, who finished second here last time around, has won it. The Athletes' Village is not a place for fighting. I've never heard that ever in Olympic and Paralympic history. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast. We cover the games all the time, rather than just once every four weeks. I'm Michael. And I'm John. Coming up in this episode, we're joined by the new world snooker champion. He's made history at the Crucible. Yes, after a slight detour last weekend for the London Marathon, I've been in Sheffield for much of the last 17 days. For a championship, John, that certainly delivered. And we'll have all the news from the Games, including a big change to a sporting institution in the Steel City. We've got athletics, we've got taekwondo, wheelchair tennis and also modern pentathlon. And as ever, you can let us know what you think. Get in touch any time. We love to see you on Twitter at anything but F. I mentioned I was at the uh, Crucible Theatre. There was a journalist there called Nick, Nick Metcalf who said he loved what we do on Twitter. He loved following all the Olympic and Paralympic news. So join the club. You can also message us on Instagram and on Facebook. You can find us online at anythingbutfooty.com and drop us an email anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. Now, I know snooker is not a sport that we've talked about a lot on the podcast, but I had the opportunity uh, for Talk Sport to go and cover the World Championships. Now, snooker is probably, I would say, the sport I grew up watching most of mm. as a child. I think I was probably watching snooker uh, before I was watching even the Olympic Games and certainly the Paralympic Games. I've just got this thing, John, for these 17-day events. <laughs> You know what I mean? The World Snooker Championships and the Olympic Games. The snooker was always something uh, I certainly inherited from my my late father, uh, the love of the game. And it's always been an ambition of mine to get to the Crucible and cover the World Snooker Championships. And this year, uh, for for radio, through radio, I got the opportunity to do that. And that meant I had the privilege afterwards of speaking to a man who's got his name on the trophy for the very first time. A man who was the youngest ever qualifier at the Crucible, but had never previously won a match there until this year. The man that staged the greatest ever comeback in Crucible history in his semi-final against Si Jiao Wei, coming from nine frames behind. And a man who is the first snooker player from mainland Europe to be crowned world champion. It's Luca Brussel. Yeah, it just means everything, you know. Um... Coming here, I expected nothing. To, to be honest, uh, my season hasn't been uh, my season's been quite good actually, but I haven't been playing that well the last few months. Um, I lost a close game to Joe O'Connor in the Players Championship, and that sort of set me back a little bit mentally as well. And um, I just needed a good run in this tournament to yeah to get my confidence back, and so to win it just means everything. And I mean, even if I don't win a game anymore, 
in my whole career I'm, I'm going to be happy and yeah it's just it's going to take some time to sink in that's for sure and you talk about the run it was quite a run because you've done this the hard way you've taken on the big players you've staged the greatest ever crucible comeback even to get to the final as well yeah and I never thought I would would have it in me you know to to come back every game and you know it's such a long tournament even if you win it easily it's it's so tough but to win it the hard way is it's so tough it's mentally draining and I could really feel it yesterday I, I had a really bad session against Mark 6-3 I lost I think and um, I was just so tired and mentally I was I was gone I couldn't focus anymore and um, to be honest I thought I lost it there when I got to 9-8 um, but yeah somehow I still managed to win the game and that just shows you that I'm that I'm a fighter probably and uh, that I deserve it maybe how tough was the final and how tough an opponent is Mark Selby? Yeah, I've said it before, he's he's definitely the toughest. You know, I've played them all. I've played Higgins, I've played Ronnie, I've played uh, Judd, Robertson, but Selby is by far the toughest. You know, because even at 16-10, you know, most players would just just play an attacking game, just go for the shots and see what happens, but he just plays the same game and he, he tries to make it so difficult for you, which is, yes, it's just the worst situation to be involved in when you're... When you're nervous, like I was at 16:10, and I just wanted to get over the line as quick as possible, and that's not that's not what happened. So I really had to fight for it in the end. And yeah, I mean, he's a four-time world championship uh, world champion, so that that says enough, I think. Can you describe the moment for me when you knew you'd won? How emotional that was! Finally, getting your hands on what is a very famous trophy in world sport. Yeah, just all of the pressure on my shoulder just fell off, and. Um, I was just loving every moment. I, I wanted to clear the whole table. I missed the yellow. I was a bit disappointed because I just wanted to be on the table forever after I got match ball. And um, Yeah, just unreal moment. Unreal. What does it mean back in Belgium for you to be world champion? What will the reaction be at home? I have no idea. I can't wait to see it, but I'm sure it's going to explode. And um, Hopefully this is going to make snooker big like, like, like it did with darts. You know, Darts is very big in Belgium since a couple of years and um, I think this win is going to change it as well for snooker. And yeah, I, I really can't wait to see it. The money is nice. The prize money is good. But Luca Brassel, world champion, that is what you came for. What does that mean to you when you hear those words? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, uh, it's just, yeah, I just can't believe it, to be honest, to be called champion of the world. And it's, I'm going to hear it for the next year at least. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be just a fantastic year. I'm just going to enjoy it. Uh, try to play as many tournaments as possible, and yeah, it's gonna be gonna be surreal to be yeah uh, introduced as the defending world champion. And just finally, then you've spoken a lot during this tournament about your preparation. You just partied hard. You said it was illegal to have the preparation that you had to then come in and become world champion. But now, 17 days on, too exhausted for a few points. Yeah, just a couple, probably just to settle down a bit, but. Um, yeah, it's going to be home tomorrow. It's going to be a long drive, so uh, got to be fresh for that. And but yeah, I'm just going to enjoy the moment. And uh, as you said, no preparation at all this year. And um, I guess it worked. Great to hear from Luca Brussel, Michael. And the, what you said at the start about how many records he's broken, the youngest ever, the comeback, the first European winner of continental Europe. What could that mean for the, the game of snooker? I think it could be big. I mean, it was very interesting that as the the 17 days progressed, suddenly um, lots of Belgian journalists started turning up. It was the Belgian Cup final at the weekend, for example. That's the equivalent of the FA Cup final. Antwerp won the the Belgian Cup final at the weekend. That's football. I know we're in a thing but footy, but I just want to use it as a reference point. A contextualisation. So, so that was a big deal. That is a big deal in Belgium. They're coming to the climax of their, their football season as well. And actually, Luca Brussel's team, uh, Genk, uh, 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 are there or thereabouts to, to try and, and win that title. But the top trending sports story, and in fact, one of the top trending news stories in Belgium, right across the last week or so, has been Luca Brussel. He really has caught the imagination in Belgium. And I'll tell you what, if you'd gone back five years, ten years, and said to me, apart from you know the United Kingdom and Ireland, where will we get a snooker world champion from? Mm. I remember the days when, obviously, there was a decent cohort of Canadian players like Cliff Thorburn, 
who was there, actually saw him last night, Kirk Stevens, Bill Wobanek, Jim White and others. There's obviously always been useful Australian players and Neil Robertson, of course, has, has won the title relatively recently. But I would have said to you, I think the next country to have a winner at the World Championships would have been China. Mm. That, is, that is the nation I think we all thought was going to deliver a World Champion sooner rather than later. And Ding Zhen, we went close, uh, but never got over the line. I certainly wouldn't have said to you Belgium. In terms of snooker in, in Europe, uh, there, there is a tournament in Germany. Um, there was some Portuguese media at the Crucible and, and when Barry Hearn had a bit of a walk around last night and came and pressed the flesh, the Portuguese media were, were saying to him, you know, I, I really want a, a tournament in Portugal, come to, to, come to Portugal, we'll, we'll bat the tournament, why haven't you done that? I think they'll probably end up going to Qatar in the desert before they get to Portugal, to be honest. But yeah, this could be a, a game-changing moment in Belgium. So much interest and I think one of the great things, one of the final things I'd say about it is in Luca Brussel, they have a very charismatic ambassador for the sport. Mm. So if they do want to, and I'm sure there will be lots of boys and girls across Belgium maybe picking up a snooker cue for the first time this week, having watched a bit of Luca Brussel. If they do want to have someone to follow, they have someone who is, as I said, charismatic, someone that plays the game the right way, a bombastic presence, has some personality. He's very much in the kind of makeup of an Alex Higgins or a Jimmy White or a Ronnie O'Sullivan. And that is exciting. He's exciting to watch. He's got a good sense of humour. He's got a great personality. He's the perfect sort of uh, trailblazer, if you like, for, for European and Belgian snooker, I would guess. I suppose as well, getting it back to the Olympics, which we will in a moment, the fact that he said he hadn't practised before the uh, Snooker World Championships and he was partying and boozing um, might just kind of question the whole whether snooker could ever be part of the Olympics. If you could do that without actually doing much training before it, a lot of our listeners who, who will uh, uh, hopefully, who are athletes who are pounding the flesh every, uh, every day might think that's a little strange. Yeah, well, the, the WPBSA, who are the, the governing body of, of snooker, as I understand it, they did make a tentative bid to try and, and get snooker in the Olympic Games. I think Tokyo 2020 was, was the target. There, there was talk about a bid possibly for Paris in 2024 as well through the, the kind of rival World Snooker Federation. But whilst um, Q Sports have always been affiliated, they've always been an affiliated sport of the IOC, I don't think it's ever been a serious uh, issue. A uh, serious sort of consideration. Part of the reason for that, obviously, as I mentioned, is it hasn't really got that global appeal that you need to have to be an Olympic sport. I think Paul might have a better opportunity. Also, I mean, the World Championships is a grueling event, 17 days. You couldn't have that at the Olympic Games. You would need to come up with some kind of shorter, more impactful format. I actually did say to Luca Brussel, I think during the first week, uh, we were just having a, a chat after one of his matches. Might have been his his win uh, earlier on in the tournament over possibly Ronnie O'Sullivan. And I did say to him, you know, would you ever think about the Olympics? Is it a sport? Is it an event that you'd you'd like your sport to be involved in? And he just went no. And I went, just think about it for a minute. What would it like to to win a gold medal for Belgium? He went, do you know what? I just don't care. <laughs> and, um, you know, he grew up watching the Crucible. He grew up watching players lift that World Championship trophy that he lifted last night. And, and that is what he, he's dreamt about doing. And I know we've had this same debate in golf and in tennis in recent years as well. It, it's not the be all and end all. It's not the biggest thing. I think snooker in the Olympics, probably a long way off, as I said. Paul, with a, a more global appeal and, you know, a quicker format and maybe a younger appealing sport. Maybe maybe if, if Paul put a serious sort of bid together, that might be something worth looking at. Apart from the Borley brothers in athletics, uh, obviously we, we, we don't mention footballers like Vincent Company, but I reckon Luca Brussel may be the most famous Belgium since Hercule Poirot. Kim Kleisters. Mm, I was, yeah, I was, not bad. I was, not bad. Uh, I was having this conversation. I was trying to explain to the Belgian journalist what, what BBC Sports Personality of the Year is. And I said it's like the closest we have in the United Kingdom to the Oscars in terms of, you know, talkability and build up and red carpet and debate over who wins and who loses and who's on the shortlist and who's nominated. Uh, and I, they said, well, we do have a sort of similar things. And I said, well, Luca Brussel's got to be 
got to be there or thereabouts. And I would I would take your Hercule Pyro and just mention it's a fictional character. So I'm not <laughs> having it. I'm not having it. Kim Kim Gleisers or Luca Brussel. Okay, I'll stick with me Borley brothers uh, on the uh, on the 400 meters track. Uh, Evo just... Van Dam, the legendary athlete who now has a, a died in, in very tragic circumstances. Actually, oh Evo Van Dam um, now has a meeting named after. Um, as well, oh. another legendary Belgian uh, performer. They've got a number of very good cyclists as well. Cycling's big yes, in Belgium, that, but yeah. but Lucas should keep that date free for Belgian Sports Personality of the Year because he'll be there or thereabouts this year. Claude Van Damme, that's the only other one I can uh, come up with. Uh, just quickly on the snooker, I, I obviously paid a lot more interest in it this year because you were there and and, and, and doing things, but I did think it, it did capture the imagination. I think, obviously, the protest... Uh, um, rightly or wrongly for just stop oil dragged it into headlines and and reminded people it was on it seemed like a lot of people were watching it certainly uh, from what i saw on on the final and and watching on television that's what terrestrial television coverage gives you and why the likes of kazoo uh, will probably pay a fair amount of money to sponsor the uh, world snooker championships but i tell you what who i was really impressed with obviously luca obviously seeing the, the sublime and frankly ridiculous at times ronnie o'sullivan but hazel irvin Oh, the calmness and the brilliance of her interview with Luca. Straight, literally, you cut, she walks straight into that auditorium and does two interviews without even an um or an er. Uh. I mean, yeah. I, I've always said she's the most underrated. You've said she's the most underrated sports broadcaster in uh, the BBC. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her in a queue at Sao Paulo Airport uh, while flying back from Rio. Um, and I, I've always thought she's absolutely un, um, unbelievably good and always knows what to say. And I thought she got it spot on last night. Yeah, she's been doing it, obviously, for two decades now. So, you know, I think she's very comfortable there. It is very much a natural home for her. I saw her around um, a few times. I once sat, na- sat next to her at Coventry City's um, Player of the Year Awards, the year they got relegated um, from the Premier League. So, And I remember her telling me at the time that, that she goes into every event that she does and prepares for it like a university dissertation. And I think in this age now of sort of television producers and, you know, social media, I imagine that there's TV producers at the BBC that see her arrive with these giant folders and books that she always has out in front of her on the table at any event that she does. And they're probably there going, Hazel, any chance you could put that on the iPad? Because that is the way, you know, TV sport is now. But she's she's like me. She likes to handwrite all her notes out and everything. And, um, yeah, I agree with you. I think she's she's absolutely terrific. I thought she was excellent, again, across the 17 days. I've said this before. I mean... With no disrespect to the likes of, you know, um, Jackie Oatley and, for example, Gabby Logan and Sue Barker, other female broadcasters that have picked up gongs from the the Queen as it was in the birthday of the New Year's Honours. How Hazel Irvin, she may well have been offered one and turned it down, you don't know. Mm -hmm. How Hazel Irvin hasn't uh, picked up something like that over the years that she's been doing it. Her Olympic broadcasting goes back to Seoul in 1988, for example. And just finally, away from sort of the broadcasting side, I agree with you. I think it was a classic crucible. The 2147s, Kyron Wilson, then obviously Mark Selby in the yeah, final. Yeah, of course. Two great semi finals, the best crucible comeback ever, as I mentioned with Luca Brussel. The other semi final uh, with Mark Selby and Mark Allen was brilliant as well. I didn't think Ronnie caught fire. In this one, I thought it was very hard to call in the early days. John Higgins seemed to be breezing through, and then suddenly John Higgins was was out and uh, lost. Um, yeah, I just thought it was really good. And I think from a, a public imagination point of view, we had the right winner because, you know, Mark Selby's a great guy. Clearly, um, as we know, has had some really, really difficult times recently um, with his mental health. Um, obviously, very difficult times as a child, losing his father, his, his wife, um, it was mentioned last night as part of the broadcast, has been quite ill recently as well. And a great guy has maintained his sense of humour and his dignity um, around the, the crucible over the past 17 days, a brilliant competitor. But in terms of that, are people talking about the snooker around the water cooler today? The Belgian, Luca Brussel winning, I think is the moment that, that people will be discussing more.
I agree. And, and staying with Sheffield and a coming of age of a sporting institution, if you like. After 21 years, the English Institute of Sport is rebranding and becoming known as the UK Sports Institute. It's decided over the last five Olympic and Paralympic cycles, the Institute has evolved, providing high level support to athletes on a world class programme, of course, from both the likes of Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, as well as England. So the UK Sports Institute, they say, is a much clearer and accurate depiction of of everything the organisation has and continues to do. There will be no change to those services that they offer, but UK Sports CEO Sally Mundy welcomed the announcement and said she's looking forward to seeing what the next 20 years has in store. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast. Stay with us. We will be talking modern pentathlon very shortly. Wheelchair tennis, taekwondo and athletics next. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. You're listening to Anything But Footy, and with the indoor and cross-country seasons now complete, the world's leading track and field athletes now turn their attention to the premier one-day meeting circuits. All ahead of another World Championships this year in Budapest, the Wanda Diamond League kicks off incidentally in Doha on the 5th of May as the international calendar outdoors moves into top gear. It's been confirmed that Keely Hodgkinson will compete at the London Olympic Stadium for the very first time this summer, having won all, and I do mean all, her Olympic, World, European and Commonwealth medals since the event was last held in London. I find that absolutely staggering. She is a uh, superstar for British athletics and hopefully for Team GB again, of course, coming up in Paris. Hodgkinson will line up in the women's 800 metres as athletics returns to the capital city on Sunday, July 23rd for the Diamond League London. And if you are interested in going, it's just £23 for adults and £5 for juniors. A chance to see some of the leading stars of British athletics in action. Key Hodgkinson would be one of my uh, bets do gamble responsibly for BBC Sports <laughs> personality at the end of the year if she uh, does get a gold medal at the World Athletics Championships yes. in August in Budapest. Yeah, good call. Total of 11 athletes heading to Azerbaijan for the World Taekwondo Championships later this month. They include four medalists from the previous Worlds in Mexico, which were actually held last November. They include Bradley Sindon, Jay Jones, double Olympic champion, Rebecca McGowan and Aaliyah Powell. One of seven female fighters, this might be a new name to you, Bianca Cook. Liverpudlian, of course, better known under her maiden name, Bianca Walkton. Of course. Looking to, looking to regain her world title after success in 2015, 17 and 19. She was out injured last year, married, of course, now to Aaron Cook, who's also a taekwondo athlete. Afghanistan-born Farzad Manzuri, who trains alongside the Great Britain taekwondo athletes in Manchester, will participate in his second successive world championships as a refugee athlete. He'll compete in the 80 kilogram under weight category, something we discussed with CEO Paul Buxton in our Great British Bosses season earlier this year. Make sure you follow us to hear all of those interviews. Yeah, on to some other news from the Games. And nine wheelchair tennis players, including Alfie Hewitt, Gordon Reid and Lucy Shuka, are representing Great Britain this week at the 2023 BMP Paribas World Team Cup in Villamora in Portugal. The tournament is the equivalent, of course, to the Davis Cup and Billie Jean King Cup. Now, I actually watched, Michael, some of the Billie Jean uh, King Cup in Coventry earlier this, um, oh, a few weeks ago, last month. Britain, of course, women lost, unfortunately, no Emma Raducanu, which was the, the main headline for most people. But everywhere it was branded World Cup of Tennis. So it's the Billie Jean King Cup, but they brand it hashtag World Cup Tennis. Well, why don't you just call it that? Rather than having a totally different name. Now, look, I appreciate the Davis Cup is historical. And, the, and for tennis fans, Davis Cup means something to people. Billie Jean, of course, is one of the greatest tennis players of all time. So it means something to tennis players. But for the average punter, the people who are watching the Kazoo World Snooker Championships on the telly last night, if you called it the World Cup of Tennis, they might just understand what it was about. 
It's an interesting one. I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, we talk, don't we, in this country about winning the Jules Rimet trophy, mm. uh, but actually it was winning the World Cup of men's football in 1966. So, yeah, I mean, it's, does the current Football World Cup have a name? Do we know that? Or is it just, just the World Cup now? Uh, I think Messi just owns it now, doesn't he? I, <laughs> I, I think he's just taken it home with him. But, yeah, no, I think there is a name for it. But I don't, but you're right. But I only think Jules Rimet became famous because of um, Lightning Seeds and Skinner and Badil. That okay. in, that, in that song, the three lions, Jules Rimet. I'm not sure anyone else would have called it that before Jules Rimet is still gleaming. <laughs> We're covering a lot of ground in this podcast. Uh, let's move on and get, let's get back to my comfort zone. Modern pentathlon. The World Cup moved into Budapest at the weekend. Two British women, Olivia Green, Charlie Follett, finishing sixth and tenth, respectively. You remember in Tokyo at the Olympics, of course, two gold medals for British men and British women at the uh, modern pentathlon on the final day. Uh, Green then teamed up actually with Henry Chung in the mixed relay. Joe Chung was the gold medalist uh, back in Tokyo, but it was Henry in the mixed relay. Leading through the laser on the British pair just missed out on the medals in fourth position. Now, as ever, you can get in touch with anything but footy. As Michael said, we love to hear from you on Twitter. You can message us on Insta or Facebook. Uh, anythingbutfooty.com is our website and anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. And they reckon, Michael, that word of mouth is the best way now of showing why people should listen to podcasts so it's a recommendation that's how most people find out about podcasts so what i'm going to ask everyone to do if you're listening to this episode is tell someone email someone retweet something just tell someone that you're an olympic and paralympic fan if you love the olympics and paralympics like you do i guarantee that other of your friends would do likewise so just tell someone else about this podcast and make sure that they're aware of it ahead of paris 2024 and you do occasionally get some left-field 90s dance music news as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not sure it was a dance song, but uh, you know what I mean. Uh, we've got a special episode coming up in the next few weeks. We're going to be focusing on the grassroots level of sport in this country and the current challenges facing them, particularly amongst young people. So stay with us for that. A very special episode of Anything But Footy coming soon. Social Podcast Network. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you Lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.